The tale of Welland is one of my favourite Norse legends. Welland the Smith was a happily married man who made fantastic swords and jewellery. One night, in his sleep, he was captured by the cruel King Nithard. The king imprisoned Welland on an island and forced him to make jewellery for him. To make sure he couldn't escape, the king ordered him to be hamstrung. Crippled, knowing he wouldn't see his wife again, Welland exacted a terrible revenge. He murdered the king's sons, fashioned goblets from their skulls, jewels from their eyes and a brooch from their teeth. Wayland then took back his wedding ring from the king's daughter before raping her, fathering a son and escaping on a pair of wings he'd made earlier. A truly grim fairy tale, but one that might actually contain a grain of truth. Many of the Anglo-Saxon smiths may well have been slaves like Welland. The gold and treasures found at Sutton Hoo had made historians question if Anglo-Saxon kings really had lived in small wooden hovels. It couldn't have been in places like this. After the Second World War, archaeologists discovered evidence that Anglo-Saxon kings lived in giant wooden palaces. We now think that Anglo-Saxon kings lived in huge halls like this replica in Kent. Digs at Yavering in Northumbria unearthed a hall twice the size of this one, with an auditorium that seated over 300 people. These halls feature in Old English poems like the epic Beowulf, which, for me, gives the most evocative idea of life in the hall. Indeed, the poem opens with the command, what, listen, which you can imagine being shouted across a crowded hall of drunken warriors. Him on mod bean, that heo resed hatten walder, medo arna michel men ye werken, thona ildo bean, afra ye frunon, on thar on inan eal ye dailen, Yeongum on de aldum swilcha him god sealda. This replica hall was built by the Regia Anglorum Society. The 700 members devote their weekends to recreating Anglo Saxon life in Kent. We wanted somewhere where we could do practical mm. archaeology mm. and to recreate things which we, uh, we know exist in the archaeological record mm. in the environment in which they had been originally used. So it's like living research? Yeah, that's right. It is somewhere where we can trace the footprints of our ancestors mm. and we feel very strongly that if we can trace their footprints in time, if we can see what they saw. So you think the interior of these halls would have been brightly decorated and coloured? Very much so. We know that our Anglo-Saxon ancestors enjoyed bright colours because they lived in a fairly drab world. Mm. The apex of our porch has some very pretty colours on there. Yes, because it's a very bright use of blues and reds and golds. Absolutely. And very regal as well, the palette of colours. Yeah, yeah, you might even say it looked like a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> In 597, a man came across the sea with an idea that would transform the art of the Anglo-Saxons. Saint Augustine was on a mission from God and Pope Gregory. He stepped off his boat right here, well, just over there, close to what's now Saint Augustine's golf course. Legend has it that Pope Gregory's decision to convert the pagan Anglo-Saxons came about thanks to a papal pun. 
On seeing some angles in a Roman slave market, he asked, where are they from? Hearing that they are angles, he said, they are not angles, but angels. So the Pope decided the angle angels were so beautiful they had to be Christian. He dispatched St Augustine to ensure that all of the British Isles would now follow him and God, not Odin and lots of pagan gods. So what was life like in these newly converted kingdoms? Well, it was quite nice, actually. According to Bede, a monk writing sometime later, in Edwin's Northumbria, it was completely safe for a woman and child to walk from one end of his lands to the other. And when times were tough and peasants turned up at Edwin's great hall in search of food, he not only gave them his dinner, but the silver plate it was on too. What a nice man. It sounds like a peaceful time. It wasn't always quite like that, but it was a time when pagan and Christian beliefs did coexist, and this was reflected in the art. <laughs> Here, in the British Museum, is one of the best examples that shows how readily the Anglo-Saxons were prepared to follow both Christ and Odin. This is one of my favourite pieces, the silver and gilt belt buckle from Crundale in Kent. This is a serious piece of double-edged art, literally. Look at how these symbols sit alongside each other. Knotted pagan snakes and a Christian fish. This piece clearly shows it was made at a time when the Anglo-Saxons were hedging their bets, embracing Christianity and keeping hold of their pagan heritage. Looking at it now, you can imagine the sort of man who commissioned it. One week, he's fasting for Easter. The next, he's feasting for the goddess Aostra. For about a century, the Anglo-Saxons continued to flip between paganism and Christianity. And sometime in the seventh century, one stunning piece of art was created that perfectly encapsulated this eclectic view of the world. In 1857, the avid Victorian collector Sir Augustus Wollaston Franks was on a shopping trip to Paris in pursuit of his favourite pastime, buying antiques. He heard about a rather unusual item a dealer had for sale. It had lay hidden for nearly a thousand years. And eventually, it wound up in a Parisian antique shop. When Wollaston Frank saw it, he couldn't resist. Today, it's known as the Frank's casket. Carved out of whalebone, it's an amazing visual representation of the early Anglo-Saxons' view of the history of the world. It's well over 1,200 years old now, and it has to be kept in a climate-controlled case. It's far too delicate to be handled. So the British Museum had this replica made, which I can hold. And this means I can show you that the Frank's casket is a truly three-dimensional art object. It's like an Anglo-Saxon Rubik's cube. But if we start at the front, where the key would enter the lock that's now missing, we've got two very enigmatic scenes. Here to the left, we've got the legendary Germanic story of Welland the Smith. Welland has killed the king's son and is offering a drugged goblet made from his skull to the daughter. And to the side of this, three figures, the three magi, approaching two figures here. 
Mary and Jesus have been abbreviated to teardrop shaped heads. A scene from Germanic myth alongside a Christian image. But if we turn it around to the left, something else enters the equation. A scene from Roman legend. Here we've got a very unusual version of Romulus and Remus being nursed by the wolf. Typically, they're shown as children underneath the wolf, but the Anglo-Saxons have shown them as full-grown adults lying out prostate on the ground. With this upside-down wolf here, But I love this object because it captures that moment when the Anglo-Saxons are moving from paganism to Christianity. And in this one piece, we've got so many of the legends and so much of the imagery that had previously dominated Anglo-Saxon art. A century after St. Augustine had landed, stone symbols of the Christian faith began to dominate the British landscape. In the wooden world of the Anglo-Saxons, stone crosses made a big impact. This proved to be an effective advertising campaign, one that definitely said paganism was fading away and Christianity was here to stay. New churches and abbeys sprung up throughout the Anglo-Saxon lands. In 674, Abbot Benedict Biscop founded a monastery here. Now, very few Anglo-Saxon buildings survive, but inside, the entire chancel is original. In its day, this place was an island of Mediterranean culture in a sea of barbarism. The abbot, Biscop, was a well-travelled man. In his lifetime, he made many trips to Rome, and I think he fell in love with the place. So much so, that he decided to create a little bit of Rome here in the northeast of England. The chancery he built is now one of the oldest buildings in Britain. But working in stone wasn't the only idea Biscop brought back from his travels. Biscop introduced another new concept, one the Anglo-Saxons had never seen before and one that we couldn't live without today glazed windows. This is it, one of the earliest stained glass windows in Britain. But Jarrow wasn't to be remembered for its stonework and glass. There was another art form that it was to become world famous for, manuscripts. Although the whole country was now Christian, the church was effectively split in two. On the one side were the newly converted Anglo-Saxons in England. On the other were the Celtic churches in the rest of the country. The easiest way to understand their artistic and spiritual differences is to look at how they both drew people. This is the McDernan Gospel, it's typical of the style of manuscript produced by the very early Christians in the Celtic parts of Britain and Ireland. It's small because it was designed to be carried by the clergymen as they travelled around the land preaching. The depiction of the figure is very stylized. It's almost a cartoon. If you look at the feet, they're cloven, not at all realistic. Some scholars have speculated it comes from a belief that only God can create a true image of man. 